Ambassador, strategic marketing consultant, and keynote speaker. Please welcome Gail Now, Gail Robertson. Thank you, Jim. That is a great introduction. And after such a great meal tonight, I love haggis. Yes. And growing up in a household with a mother who worked at a butcher shop and a father from Scotland, things like haggis and liver and cow tongue were considered pretty normal dinner fare. And the grace tonight also brought back many great memories. Now my father was not a religious man, but when we did say grace, it was some have eat and kind of eat and some he name but want it. And it was less a prayer and more of a theatrical performance. <laughs> Ironically, my father never came to the Robbie Burns dinners when I was growing up. In the hometown where I'm from, the dinners were held at the local Presbyterian church. They were a dry event. So my father said, it's nay a real bones of Ben if you nay can have a wee ram. <laughs> so instead, I went each year with my truly English mom. But my father was indeed a big fan of Robbie Burns. And I realized the impa impact that had on both him and me now as an adult. My father came from Motherwell, Scotland. He came in the 1950s, and he came with a few things. He came with the clothes on his back, a couple hundred dollars, and his book of Robbie Burns poems. Some people carry a Bible. For my dad, it was the Bard's book. And it was extremely symbolic. My father grew up in the tenements of Motherwell. By age 13, he was working at the shipping docks. He had no formal education, but he did, was read a lot, and was self-taught. And as I have been doing research, I realized how much my father connected with Robbie Burns, the working man. Now, some things we know about Burns, we heard some things tonight. He was born on this date, 1759. He died at the age of 37. He had no formal education. He was born to poor tenant farmers. And by age 15, he was already writing poetry. And again, also had no formal education. And the more that I saw about the connection of Burns and my father, I knew how important tonight was in giving the immortal memory. And being here tonight, I know my father would be very happy because there's also a bar here. <laughs> Table 21. <laughs> Table 21. Kidding aside, when I was growing up, I didn't have a very close connection with my father. But there were some things that I did learn from him, and it had to do with Burns. The love of the written word, the love of reading, and that connection that we were able to have because of Burns. And also, the name of Robertson. It comes with a heritage and a lineage that also was about hard work and tenacity and passion and charisma. If there was one thing my father had was charisma. And I'm told that was passed on to me. And also, to my son, Aiden James Robertson, who is here with me tonight. Woo! The power that is in a name that connects us to our lineage, to our history. As I was preparing to come tonight, and as Jim said, yes, there were some preparations made, but I was also extremely nervous here I was coming to do the immortal memory to basically the Robbie Burns fan club. <laughs> so, needs to say, I was a little nervous. For those of you that aren't aware, I was asked actually, gave a little tap on the shoulder, okay, maybe a nudge from Eric Main, who I work with, 
in the, new, in the journalism world. And I knew that, okay, I'm gonna tap into my journalism roots and I better do some research, some serious research. So I reached out to the Burns Center at the University of Glasgow. And I was connected up with Professor Murray Pittock. Now Professor Pittock is an aficionado of all things Burns. He has been interviewed on BBC, he's written articles, and we had this great discussion about all the wonderful things about birds. And then I got excited for two reasons. One is he told me he was the lead author of this research study that was just released this past week at the Scottish government in parliament. And this study came out and said that the Burns brand is worth 200 million pounds a year to the Scottish economy. 200 million pounds based on tourism and Burns Cottage and festivals. And then I got excited for another reason because, well, branding is what I do. In my business with Gail Now, I work with companies and individuals to help them look at telling their story. What is their brand? And how can that help them with their business? So branding, we think of branding for things like Starbucks, Harley Davidson, and personal brands like Oprah or even Elvis. Household names that we can connect with. And then I thought, well, those are names that we know. When it comes to Robbie Burns, outside of probably people here tonight and in Scotland, not everybody may connect exactly with the name of Burns. But they can connect with his work. And when we look at the importance of a great brand, when it can be about your work and not just about you as the individual, that is so key. And then I also realized that Burns has some big name fans. In 2004, Kofi Annan, who was the UN Secretary General, gave a talk about in tribute to Robbie Burns. And he called him a true humanitarian. And then we have noted American poet and civil rights activist, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou called him a spiritual humanitarian. She started reading his work as a young child. And then she made a pilgrimage to Scotland for his 250th birthday. And then we have American singer-songwriter Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan said Burns was his greatest creative inspiration. So then next I thought, I became curious and I said, how did Burns manage after coming up on soon 300 years later that he has this brand that has such great value in Scotland and there are, there are Burns dinners tonight happening all across the world that are people celebrating. How does that happen? Well, with branding, number one is content. You have to have great content to stay in that test of time. So then we look at Burns, not only his 700 poems, there was quantity, but what's the quality of work that he did? So when we think of poems like, or songs, that is played like All Lang Syne, that has also been something that's celebrated every year at New Year's Eve internationally. Burns wrote satire, he wrote humor, he wrote about the drunken debauchery of a night out with Tam O'Shanter. And in 1937, John Steinbeck wrote Of Mice and Men. And I want to quote from that, which started out with, We sneak it, cower and timorous beastie. Oh, what a panic's in the breastie. And then it went on. But mousy, thou art no thy lane. Improving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes, oh mice and men. Gang off the glee, and leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Great inspiration. Then 
The next step I would look at would be when it comes to branding is networking, making those connections. Now Burns was a consummate networker, a man after my own heart. So he left Alloway and traveled to Edinburgh. Now then and now I would say Edinburgh might be known as a bit more of the highbrow society. So when he was in Edinburgh, he was now an up and comer. He was becoming increasingly popular and he was showing up in Edinburgh and showing up at all the right parties. He was connecting with all the right people. He was with the who's who of the Enlightenment era. And he also connected up with the it girl of the time, Alison Rutherford. So as he was going to the parties and she was having these great events with music and dancing and debates. And we all know us Scots love us a good debate. And he was known for his charm and his wit and his definite good looks. So the women adored him and he adored them. And then from the networking came self-promotion. Now in speaking to Professor Piddock, he actually said it was a conscious development of his brand, which was very unusual in the 18th century. Professor Pittick said he was a pioneer in self-promotion. And here's where there's a little twist. We have a man who at this point was increasingly popular, quite famous, had this charm, was connecting with all the right people. He also was having portraits done. Now at that time, portraits weren't done by the common man. If you were having portraits done, you had some money to pay for those. So he had these portraits done, he was at these parties, and every time he showed up at a party, and often in the portraits, he'd be wearing his farm boots and his work clothes. He reckoned that if he promoted himself and showed up as a penniless man of the soil, a man of nature, that he could connect with people to a much greater degree. And he knew that even then, people wouldn't put two and two together. And even today, we don't. And finally, when it comes to a great brand, a brand that can stand the test of time as Burns did, you need to have impact. You need to somehow connect at a level that is more than just your words or your product or your service. And this is where, brand, where, this is where Burns excelled. Maya Angelou once said, in a quote, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Burns was the supreme poet of feeling. When we look at some of his work, as I mentioned, Auld Lang Syne. Whenever I hear Auld Lang Syne, for some reason that touches someplace deep inside of me that it brings tears sometimes to my eyes. And it was because Burns often didn't write things that would offend. Often he wrote things that connected to things we could understand. Things like remembering times gone by, friends from our past. And my brother was not known as the most romantic of people. He came from good Scottish stock in terms of often not wanting to outwardly show his romantic side. At his wedding to my now sister-in-law, he read this. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonnie lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gain dry. 
Till all the seas gain dry, my dear, and the rocks smell with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee weal, my only love, and fare thee weal a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand miles. It still gives my sister-in-law goosebumps to this day. Burns was prolific. Burns was complex. He was a mass of contradictions. He could write about tender love stories, and he could also write, write some coarse and body poems as well. He was a mass of contradictions. He had a messy life. And yet, we connected with him. And we were able to make that strong connection with him because of the strength of his work. He lived, he loved, and he was imperfect. Maybe he was a boy that just liked shagging said one poet. Or maybe he was quite remarkable. And maybe we loved him because he wasn't all that precious. Maybe we loved him because he was just like us. Maybe that's where the magic happens. Please join me now in a toast to my father, George Bailey Robertson, to my brother, George Hawthorne Robertson, my son, Aidan James Robertson, and to the immortal memory of the one and only, the great Robert Burns.